So I'm going to introduce our special guests, uh, who are not allowed to give talks, because now I need to ask somebody some questions or my head's going to explode. All right. Andy Nordgren produced the interactive Emmy award-winning, previously mentioned, game, The Truth About Marika. She is currently working as a technical producer at CCP Games. Andy is one of the co-founders of the Geek Girl Meetup. She is a member of the Change Through Participation think tank Interacting Arts, uh, and was recently chosen by Swedish Internet World magazine as one of ten people who the next Swedish Prime Minister, whoever it's going to be, should really pay attention to. Uh, at CCP, Andy works on the legendary hardcore gamer MMO, EVE Online. Welcome. Thank you. Mikko Rautalahti. Mikko Rautalahti plays role-playing role games because they are awesome. When he's not pretending to be somebody very interesting or enabling others to do the same, he sits at home or at his office and writes. And it turns out that this can be a real job. Mikko is currently employed at Remedy Entertainment as a senior writer. Uh, in my neck of the woods, which is here in Helsinki, he is something of a tabletop game mastering legend. In the LARP community, he is most fondly remembered for his executive game series of mobster poker games. At Remedy, uh, Mickey makes video games like the international hit Alan Wake. Please welcome. So, this is how this is going to work. I'm just going to throw something out there and then we talk. Are you okay with this? Huh. Can someone hear me? Yes, can we? Can. Yes, we are right. Excellent. Are we good? Okay, so my first question to you is what is your job? Mickey, do you want to start? Andy? Mickey? Um, Basically, I just make up some shit and somebody else makes it look good. Uh, honestly, it's, it's um, a kind of a simplification, but that's really what it comes down to. I just make up things and then I sort of try to argue other people into implementing them in a way that's cool. Uh, which is, it, it really is an actual job, which is amazingly sort of weird to me. Even today, I've been doing that for about four years now. And I just make up stories and try to make them as interactive as I can which is often very hard. <laughs> okay, I have follow-up questions on that, but let's continue with Andy. Andy, what's your job? All right, so I make the technology so that other people can come up with some, some stuff and <laughs> <laughs> pass it off. No, uh, so I work a lot on the server technology behind EVE Online, which really is the key to making it one single universe that everyone that plays the game participates in, which is a big difference from many other online games that are all kind of cloned into different servers and it creates a very LARP-like computer game. Mm -hmm. So essentially, people like her make me look good. It, like, <laughs> honestly, because like, they do the heavy lifting. <laughs> but, but when you write, I, I mean, I don't, you, you said before that you don't want to come and talk, because everybody understands how a video game is written. I genuinely have no idea, I'm, yep, I'm ashamed to not. say. So, so, but, but I do understand a fair bit about how role-playing games are written. So when you came from your role-playing background, and you also worked, didn't you, do, didn't you do some writing, temp writing for White Wolf, basically, and those kinds of things? So you got in through mm -hmm. tabletop games. When you moved into the video games industry, did you understand what your job was? Well, yeah, pretty much. Um, I also have kind of a really long background in video game journalism, such as it is. And um, <laughs> it, that, that's something I... I already had a pretty good understanding of sort of what I was getting into on that level. But of course, it's a different thing to sort of understand your abstract than others sort of sitting in the meetings where they tell you why you can do the stuff you want to do. And, uh, and there's sort of the difference between creating a LARP, for example, is that obviously making a LARP is really difficult. You need to sort of like, it gets enormously complicated and, and you're always short of money and resources and everything. But most of those problems are really sort of, most of them you can solve them just by getting somebody to come in and just do the work for you, sort of like do, do it as a favor or something. Whereas when you're making a video game, it's more about, I mean, you have to worry about stuff like disk space or, or how many hours, uh, man hours you can put into animating something or uh, like all sorts of different things like that. So, so on that level, it was very different. But um, I think a lot of storytelling, especially in role-playing games in general, and also in video games, is about manipulating the player, sort of setting up scenarios that you think are interesting and then trying to provide them with the best possible tools to sort of get through that scenario in a way that is hopefully stimulating and, uh, and a lot of fun to do. And uh, like on that level, I think it's often surprising, like extremely similar. And I, I don't think it's a coincidence that um, at Remedy, we have something like, uh, I don't know, 50 to 60 people working right now. And 
I would say that probably at least half of them are or have been role players, I, or that, that's the way it seems to me. And that's definitely not a coincidence. Mm. Is there an age uh, factor to that? So that younger people who work wouldn't, wouldn't have come in through role-playing games, so they would have come just directly through digital gaming? Yeah, uh, it's it, it generally, I think, um, like old farts like me, because I, I am ancient, obviously. Um, that, that's, that's like, you know, a lot of those people have sort of this hidden dark background. They don't necessarily even talk about it. It's sort of like, I mentioned something like, yeah, yeah, I used to play that. I'm like, really? I never knew that. And the younger people are sort of like, yeah, I just played a bunch of video games and then I got a job in the industry. So, so there's definitely sort of, uh, for a lot of those people, sort of the idea of an RPG is really something that you do with, a, with a, like a game controller. And the, and the idea of actually having like, you know, like general interactions with people is sort of like weird and alien, unless they're doing it in an online RPG, which is, of course, a completely different beast as well. Mm. I, but about I get very weird looks at, at my job because I basically went from meat space gaming, as I call it. Meat space gaming, that's what we do. Yes, nice. that's what we do. Nice. Uh, straight to working in the computer games industry with not a lot of, of computer gaming in between. And this often is very weird for people. But do you have, do you find use for, for your like conceptual understanding of what a game is? Can you apply that when you think about the job, the, about the game you're working on? Absolutely. Even from the tech side, there are some concepts that are just completely familiar and obvious to me as a, as a role player. So for example, as. the difference between the player and the character. And I've, I've found in a couple of frustrating occasions that, that this is not always well understood or, or an obvious thing to people. So sometimes people end up trying to make things that are both for the player and for the character in a weird hybrid mix. And we've had some really contentious debates with our players between CCP and the, and the EVE players around stuff like pay to win, mm -hmm. where for me it's very obvious that that debate is about the player's money and wealth replacing what was supposed to be the character's actions in the in-game universe. That's what's supposed to make the character rich or, or successful, not the money that the player behind the character has. And people get very upset about this, and they can't always necessarily express exactly what, why they feel it's wrong. But there, that's a case where I feel the, the LARP understanding some of the tools from, from our perspective have been extremely useful to pick these debates apart. Mm. So for a more conventional video game, you end up with a lot of the same uh, challenges that I remember, uh, certainly from an earlier, earlier days of LARP designing when we were all just starting out, which is how do you make the player feel that they are choosing freely while actually controlling everything they do because you don't have the resources to to put out more stuff. And now in EVE, of course, which is based more on a sandbox model, and as you said, it isn't sharded, so all of the EVE players in the world are actually interacting with each other within the same, same game, uh, same reality, so to speak. Um, I don't know, can you talk a little bit about, about that? Like, did it, are, are there physical, like, is, have you, has the video game industry solved this problem, for starters? Well, uh, to a certain extent, yeah. Um, if you look at something like Alan Wake, for example, that is a fairly linear game. There is not a lot of choice you have there, but we kind of try to give you sort of the illusion of having some sort of, uh, not necessarily choice in what you do, but sort of choice, choice in how you sort of approach the situation at hand. Um, other games go a lot further with that. Uh, you look at something like Mass Effect 3, which has sort of, uh, it has a very contentious ending that people are very angry about, but sort of discounting that, uh, it has like these amazingly complicated sort of branches that you can do, and, and we're kind of, I think really the sort of, like we're, we kind of need the technolo technological singularity to sort of get to a point where we can have the holodeck, where, where we can have some, do some sort of like real-time simulation of, of everything. <laughs> and at that point we can sort of speak about like, uh, like real role-playing. But um, I, I think there's sort of um, a lot of stuff that you can do to sort of approach that just by giving, giving sort of um, interesting, meaningful choices that, and something that sort of speaks to the player about the character they're playing. And that, that's kind of a kind of major difference that, um, especially in video games, generally you are kind of, um, either you're occupying this sort of uh, like um, empty vessel who has no real personality or anything, and then people sort of react, uh, interact with that character in very, very generic terms. Um, or then you have a character with a fairly strong personality who 
you're kind of forced to play as that character at that point. You don't really get to sort of you don't get to roll your own guy, mm -hmm. and, and 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 you don't really necessarily get to decide your own morality or anything. So it's it's kind of um, it's often really difficult to sort of find the sweet spot sort of uh, where you can have the character make a choice and make it seem like something that makes sense to a player based on what they know about the character, which isn't really role playing as such, but um, a lot of people sort of tend to approach it in the very, very much the same way that they approach role-playing characters, which I find is very interesting because um, if you look at somebody like Alan Wake, who is uh, basically like a drunken failure of a writer who kind of uh, has made a mess of his life, and there are a lot of people who sort of feel very strongly about that guy, and it, it, it's it's and and they often speak to me about the character, like like people who aren't role players, obviously, they they speak to me about the character in terms of like, like in terms that that sound very similar to how people who are role players talk to me about their characters. Which is of so they have a strong sense of ownership, yeah, yeah, yeah even though yeah. he's very predefined. Yeah, I, I guess, and it's 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 often amazing to me like the kind of things they latch on to. Mm. It, it's a sort of, uh, and, and a lot of it is very basic. So like, oh, he's very brave, and that 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 kind of thing appeals to people. Well, that hurt. It's sort of like uh, you get things like. Uh, he sort of he gets angry very easily, and that that's uh, and they kind of latch on those uh, sort of like very specific aspects of the character a lot of time, which I think is also something that people tend to do in role playing games, especially when you're playing something like a very short one shot LARP, with like you know two hours, and you generally kind of need to just like grab one thing about your character and kind of go with that, and that seems surprisingly similar in a lot of ways, and uh, and I think there are a lot of ways you could sort of you know take advantage of that. Okay, what about the content? Construction in Eve. Is this role playing or is this not role playing? I mean, it's much more like like role playing. The world. I, I started calling it a fictional reality, and that helps me better understand it because role playing is not really required to enter this universe. We conjure it up for you through the marvels of, of computer 3D rendering. So all you have to do is kind of show up, but we give you a world and we give you some agency in that world. And Eve gets accused a lot of times for not having any story or having crap story, which is very similar to, to this LARP discussion where you cannot control the story in a, in a piece that's, that's participatory. You have to kind of let go of that. So all of the writing in Eve is very much setting. It's setting up the world and what kind, explaining what kind of things people can do. So their story for why you can fly a spaceship and why you don't really die when you get blown up, for example. Mm. But that's more to explain that people can fly a spaceship than tell a story for them. And so this is a very, very different approach from, from some of the Remedy games, yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll These are just course. kind of... on almost opposite sides of the computer game spectrum in terms of storytelling. What, what I find really interesting about EVE is that um, it is a game that has quite a bit of player agency. There, there is a lot of, uh, it, it's not a question where you're sort of interacting in a sort of ready-made world. I mean, the world is obviously there, but a lot of the sort of um, social structures and everything is really player generated and, and, and they have major corporations and uh, and sort of rowing gangs of pirates and stuff like and that. That's kind of what I mean, that we give them agency yeah, in yeah. terms of creating these structures themselves. And, and, and I think it's really interesting that, that a lot of people sort of do kind of take on this fictional person when they're doing that, but a lot of those people very specifically don't call it role playing. It's more about being engaged in some sort of weird simulation where they are quite willing to do things that they would never do in real life, sort of like be complete assholes or, or be very, very sort of self-sacrificing. That, that also happens at times. And, and I think it's very interesting that, that they sort of, in even a lot of ways, they could go through a lot of the same motions, but they don't seem to have quite the same emotional attachment. But even so, like if, if, if you were just sort of like list the actions they take, I think they would be very di different, uh, sorry, similar to um, the sort of actions people often take in role-playing games, like, like, you know, like yeah. in LARPs. And there is, of course, the aspect, because it's ongoing, that there are people who have played Eve just as long as other people out there have played, let's say, Rage Across Denmark. With, you know. So if you have the same character and you play it continuously for six or seven years, we don't know. Like, as far as I know, nobody in this room knows the answer to the question of what that really does to you. Is the character separate from your personality in any meaningful way? And like, our best guess as a community right now is probably not. Um, but we should probably ask some follow-up questions about that. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to do that now, so I, ha I just have two more questions. One is, uh, coming from the LARP world, I look at this and you go like, well, we have like this, like, 
video games which have one story and blah, blah, and we have these ongoing world-building things, wouldn't you want to make like a slightly multiplayer game for like 80 to 100? I mean, don't your old LARP write sort of urges kick in and you just went, wow, if I could just write like 50 really good characters for a, for a digital game, it would be ace? Do you have that urge at all? If, if I could pick the players. Sure. <laughs> be, 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 because basic, basically, I mean, you, you, ca you come back to the thing where the uh, sort of the monkeys on time writer. And that, that is exactly what it is because it's, it's my experience that LARPs are, they're surprisingly resilient in that you can have something really go wrong and it can recover from that. But on the other, if you have like even just one person there who is not taking it seriously and who's just kind of like pissing all over the whole thing, so <laughs> and you, you get that sort of thing, and it's really like it can kill the mood instantly in a way that, that it will never recover from. And it's sort of, like if you're playing it online, for example, you can't even punch the guy. Like, like you, you can't go up to him and say, like, like, look, you're being asshole. Could you just like go, leave, please leave? I mean, you can kick him out, but at that point, it's sort of, uh, it, it gets in this whole sort of, you know, cyber harassment territory very quickly, mm -hmm. and and it's it's it just because it it, it like that 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 sort of. Um, is a thing where a lot of supervision. Oh, so I love the idea, but I need the holodeck for that, basically. Yes. That, that, that's what it always comes down to. <laughs> Andy? I think for me, the screen is suited for other kinds of experiences. For, for me, the LARP experience and also of the, the full bandwidth storytelling in the body is so key to LARP for me that I've never had a, the full urge to try and translate it into a screen media. And I, I think that, that's the answer for me. Okay, final question. There may be people out here looking for jobs or looking for a change of careers. So uh, we hear that you guys work in the greatest and also largest entertainment industry in the world, currently larger than pornography. So if you are looking for a job, you should nothing, probably... Nothing in this world is larger than pornography. <laughs> Th they say, in financial terms, you are, and uh, for that reason, you guys shouldn't be going into pornography, you should be going into digital gaming. I is, is don't know, man. Are there jobs? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Apart from pornography. Now, are there, are there jobs in your industry? D what's, what's happening with the uh, financial crisis? And all we, that? we are hiring like motherfuckers right now. L like we, we got like 20 positions opening up in the next couple of weeks. So yeah, it's a, it is a growth industry, w which is kind of not, not that surprising really because it's like that sort of, like entertainment industries tend to do pretty well when there is a recession because people are sort of willing to throw money, money at things that make them forget about how miserable they are. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess that also applies to us. I mean, it's it's not an easy industry to work in, but uh, I do think that, well, just kind of like a, a like very quick anecdote. When I sort of interviewed for my job, I was I think at the time I was still editing the uh, now unfortunately dead Roly Palaya um, RPG magazine, wi which died as RPG magazines tend to do. And at that point, I was I was being interviewed by three people, and all of those people were role players. <laughs> so it's sort of like sort of establishing a sort of rapport at that point was very simple, sort of like, hey, what kind of dice do you like? And it's like, yay, we <laughs> like D&D. I am a shadow run my, myself. And, you know, and, and from that point on, it was kind of like, it was smooth sailing. And of course, I still had to be good, but, but at least I could sort of, you know, that really broke the ice. So there's sort of, sort of, it's, sort of my experience has been that I have spent my life on stupid shit that is absolutely worth, like, like just like pop culture and then writing stupid stories and, and just like, playing role-playing games, and, and just like doing stuff that generally doesn't pay the bills. And all of a sudden I'm at a job where all of that stuff, all of that stuff is a major asset for me. Like literally, it, it's, it's what makes me capable of doing that job, which is mm -hmm. amazing. And you also have technical skills, so you also ha you haven't pissed your life away in similar ways yeah, that Nikki I, and I, I have. I, I, so I mean, she, she actually has to be competent. That, yes. That's a totally different thing. So are, there, are you guys hiring? I mean, what's, what's, what's the word, what's the buzz with, no, with work? Absolutely, both on the tech side and the design side. And I think, especially on the design side, Evil Line is really interesting because it's fairly unique in the games industry in terms of being a proper, like, full ambition computer game but there's really a design for participation at the heart of it, and the design work done, even though it is very different from, from a LARP, it is really designing for participation. So I would love to see like strong designers from our community come on board, basically, and, and help on those aspects of, of the game. That would be awesome, so call us. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> also, actually, uh, I just remembered, uh, I hear Mika Pohila is looking for a guy to write some weird transmedia LARP stuff, maybe possibly. So, you know, anybody here in Finland who's interested in that kind of stuff, 
might want to sort of look up Mika. And so there are jobs in Iceland for sure, and Finland for sure, and I know about openings in Sweden. So if you want to get into it, let's just say there's a reasonable possi possibility that you yeah, may yeah. actually have another job. Uh, because we can't all be Klaus hosted and do the LARP stuff professionally. Of course, that's the goal. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>